I've been a WWF fan since the mid-1980s, more exactly about 1985. So that's, what, 29 years this year. So I've been fortunate and blessed to be able to see a lot of the WWF and WWE over the years. Sometimes not so good and sometimes good. And I've also been able to experience a couple of really, really great eras of the WWE and of professional wrestling as a whole. Now, when I look at the history of the WWF slash WWE, there are those certain shows that really are a cut above the rest. There are those certain shows that stand the test of time, that their greatness really speaks for themselves, and are the shows that I can go back and watch no matter when, no matter what my mood, no matter what's going on. I will always find a time to go back and watch them. But to me, when it comes to the WWF slash WWE and their history, there is one show, and I emphasize this again, there is one show that truly stands the test of time. And there is one show that stands out as truly a cut above the rest. And there is one show that still to this day is the ultimate measuring stick for the WWE. The one show that still to this day the WWE aspires to achieve in 2014. And I'm of course talking about my favorite WrestleMania of all time and the WrestleMania that I argue is the greatest of all time. And that is WrestleMania 3 from the Pontiac Silverdome. Now, when you talk about great events, it depends, I guess, on your perspective. Some fans look at the characters. Some fans look at the story. Some fans look at the in-ring action. Some people look at the presentation. Some people look at a combination of things. Some people look at um, how much attention it got, how much money it drew. There are all different types of perspectives you could take for. But from my perspective, for my money, the most meaningful, significant, important, and farthest reaching show in WrestleMania history is WrestleMania 3. Now, whereas the first two WrestleManias were kind of more like spectacle showcases and trying to really get Vince McMahon to show the WWF as being more sports entertainment and really trying to change um, the approach to professional wrestling and changing the business model. WrestleMania 3 to me feels much more like a professional wrestling card than WrestleMania's 1 and 2. Now it certainly had a lot of sports entertainment elements to it and it definitely had that Vince McMahon touch and feel to it but that's not a bad thing in this case. In fact, that actually serves to, I think, elevate and raise the profile of the show. Now, a common complaint about the first two WrestleManias is that they really lacked great in-ring action and great wrestling. And WrestleMania 3 had that first kind of really, really, you know, signature WrestleMania caliber quality match. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. One knock I think I've heard over the years about WrestleMania 3 is the fact of, yeah, they drew 93,173 people, but they gave away like 15,000 tickets due to comps and etc. Well, that's how all these big events are done. Nothing should be done to dis diminish excuse me, the audience that was drawn on this day. 93,173 people to come watch professional wrestling is still 93,173 people to come watch professional wrestling. And even if only 78,000 of them actually paid for it, that's still 78,000 paying customers. You think everybody that has a ticket to the Super Bowl paid for that ticket to the Super Bowl? No, there are thousands of tickets given away every year for corporate giveaways and the like. So this is not an unheard of or a new phenomenon. The bottom line is, is they set an indoor sports attendance record that wasn't broken until the 2010 NBA All-Star Game at the new Cowboys Stadium when they put like 108,000 people in there. And don't think deep down inside Vince McMahon doesn't have that wish to be able to top what he did here at WrestleMania 3 still to this day and be able to do an event in the future where he could draw 110 or 115,000 people so that way he can ultimately flex the WWE still very, very swole muscles, if you will. But when you look at this show, like I said, they backed off some on the celebrity involvement. There were still celebrities involved. Bob Euchre was a great person to have involved in this, and he really added a lot to the show for me. 
but you bring in the people like the Alice Coopers of the world and you line him with Jake the Snake Roberts. You, know, you had people involved, but it wasn't over the top. It wasn't overblown. It was done in a much more complimentary fashion where you focus more on the characters and the performers. And that was the right course of action. Now this match ended up having 12, or this card, excuse me, ended up having 12 matches on the card. And frankly, there were a lot of short matches. I'll give you that. But that's okay. This was a loaded card, and there were a lot of things accomplished and done on this card that, to me, really helps this card stand the test of time. Hell, even the opening match, the Can-Am Connection versus Bob Orton and uh, the Magnificent Morocco, it was a solid opening tag. Yeah, it didn't go very long, but it was solid. Billy Jack Keynes and Hercules Hernandez, you know, Bobby the Brain, he in his pre-match interviews calling him Billy Jerk Haynes, really makes this for me. And you know what? Back in this time in the 80s, these were the type of personal issues you had with two unique characters. You throw a manager in the mix to get some heat on his guy, and you've got an interesting match that tells a decent story. One of my favorites from this pay-per-view is always the six-person mixed tag. And when I say mixed tag, I mean Hillbilly Jim and his team of midgets going against Kid Kong Bundy and his team of midgets. <laughs> and Kid Kong Bundy <laughs> having all the midgets come after him. And him fucking up one of the midgets is still one of those great WrestleMania memories to me. Harley Race versus the Junkyard Dog in a Loser Must Bow match. You involve Bobby the Brain Heenan here. You involve the fabulous Moolah here. I mean, yeah, maybe it's a crime that this match didn't go longer, but it is what it is. And, you know, any show that has a Harley Race and a Junkyard Dog on it and they're fighting each other instantly elevates the profile of that card a little bit. So you look at all of these great characters at this time, and it kind of represents to me when you go back and look at this show, if you want to figure out and find out what the Hogan era was of the WWF and what this era did and what went on during this era and what this era represented, this is the ultimate show to go back and watch so you can see just what was going on and give yourself the proper historical context and understand what was happening. Like you look at the Dream Team versus the Fabulous Rougeau's, a tag match. You had several tag matches on this card. You actually had, if I'm not mistaken, you had yeah, four tag matches on this card. If you're a fan of tag team wrestling, you want to watch this show. Four tag matches. A third of the matches on this card were tag matches. And what they accomplished here, the Dream Team versus the Rougeaus, the Dream Team wins. Freaking Dino Bravo screws things up because Dino Bravo sucks. But this is where they began the turn for Brutus Beefcake. And that filled right into the next match with Roddy Roddy Piper versus Adrian Adonis in this hair versus hair match. And by this time, obviously, Piper had been turned babyface. This was his retirement match because he was getting ready to go off and film They Live and some other stuff and get away from the WWF for a while. And the crowd was really into this match. You know, this was a, that type of special type of stimul stipulation, excuse me, that served as a perfect culmination for a long feud between a Piper and a an Adonis. And this came across very well. And you utilize this match here as Piper's on his way out. He beats Adonis. Adonis is going to get his hair cut. You utilize Roddy Piper to introduce a new character in Brutus Beefcake, who has now turned babyface and is going to become the barber and become one of those great mid-card babyface stars of the late 80s and early 90s. I love this match. I love how you can sit there and take a match and make it mean something with just a personal history. There doesn't have to be any belts. There doesn't have to be anything else. And you give it the serious stipulation of hair versus hair. It creates its own spectacle in its own way. Speaking of spectacle in its own way, another match I always like going back and watch is the Hart Foundation versus the British Bulldogs and Tito Santana because you involve Dirty Danny Davis here. Oh, God, he was good. <laughs> it's no surprise, frankly that so many good performers over the years came from the OVW territory run by Danny Davis because you could clearly see he understood the psychology of how to get heat on himself as a performer. Man, he made this match for me. You know, and you almost could have sat there and said, well, I wish they would have just had the Hart Foundation versus the British Bulldogs, and yeah, that would have been a tremendous match. And if you'd have let them go and had them wrestle, let's say, over the tag titles, it could have been another one of those great WrestleMania matches here on WrestleMania three. 
But this match was so awesome because you had so much story going into it with Danny Davis being a ref, and now he was a dirty ref. He was in the in the bag, and he'd sit there, he'd go in and do one unspectacular thing and celebrate it like it was the greatest thing in the world. This was fucking awesome. Like I said, this card was loaded. Butch Reed beats Coco Beware. You got Slick in Butch Reed's corner. Man, outstanding. Outstanding stuff. You know, you got the Honky Talk Man versus Jake the Snake Roberts, where... You know, Alice Cooper is with Jake the Snake, and that's pretty damn cool. Honky Tonk Man beats Jake the Snake because you're getting him ready down the road to get a long ramp run, excuse me, with the Intercontinental title. But you still give us that great kind of moment where Jake the Snake is able to put the snake on Jimmy Hart. And that was pretty damn cool. So your heel could win, you could accomplish what you wanted to accomplish, but you could still give us that great markout moment as fans where the babyface. Uh, gives the heel his come up and so to speak. You had the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov against the Killer Bees. Any of you that have watched the Iron Sheik shoots over the years know what he has to say about this match. And no respect that B. Brian Blair is Hollywood jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> that blonde jabroni, worse than the Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> so, like I said, this card was very, very loaded. And to me, when I go back and watch it, it represents so much of what the WWF used to represent for me. And it is a reminder of how great the WWF was for me during the 80s. This is the show that perfectly kind of embodies it and crystallizes it. And then we get to the two matches that ultimately everybody talks about with this show. And again, this is about your perspective in terms of which match you feel was better, which match was more important, and so on and so forth. Now, the WWE has done a tremendous job over the years of spinning the propaganda in terms of elevating the profile of Ricky Steamboat versus Macho Man Randy Savage for the Intercontinental Championship. And, you know, still sitting there and emphasizing the importance of Hogan versus Andre in the main event for the WWF title. Now, when we talk about Steamboat versus Savage, this was a match that you could say really goes back to WrestleMania 2 when Macho Man faced George Steele for the IC title because you had George Steele involved here and his crush on Elizabeth and so on. You know, Macho Man had crushed Steamboat's larynx and, you know, he wasn't sure if he was ever going to wrestle again and all this other crap. It seemed like Steamboat always got those injuries, did he? Got DDT down the concrete, got his larynx crushed and all this. But people look at this as the first truly kind of iconic, great WrestleMania match. And to a certain degree, it was. It was that first real match where you could sit there and say, it's not just about spectacle, it's not just about show, it's not just about larger-than-life characters. You can actually go and get a great, pure wrestling match. Now, with that said, I do not feel in any stretch of the imagination that this is Steamboat's greatest WrestleMania match. Or, excuse me, greatest match ever. Not even close. And this, to me, isn't even necessarily Savage's best WrestleMania match. I would argue, because of the story that it told and what he got out of the other performer, that his match against Warrior at WrestleMania 7, the retirement match, that was a better match. But this is like the first great WrestleMania match. And I think over the years, sometimes it's had its profile elevated because it was that first great match. It's a great WrestleMania match. Is it one of the ten greatest of all time? Eh, I don't know about all that. And don't dare question my love of the Macho Man or my respect for Ricky Steamboat. I'm just calling it how I see it. I do think it's a ridiculous notion, though, that all these years later, that so many fans, and granted maybe from a fan standpoint, not looking at it from a business standpoint, sit there and try and say that this was the match that stole the show because this is the propaganda the WWE has tried to pump down your throat, and that this is the match that everybody remembers, and that, 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 that. And that is complete and utter bullshit. The bottom line is, is when you're talking about professional wrestling, the number one goal, the number one goal is to draw as much money as you possibly can. And while Steamboat and Savage had a tremendous rivalry, a tremendous feud, and it was a great match, it was not the match of the night. It was not the match that everybody remembers all these years later. It was not the match that drew 93,173 people to the Pontiac Silverdome. That would be Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant for the WWF Championship. Now... You know, as a little kid, this is interesting to me because Hogan and Andre, I had always associated as being friends on screen. And when I look back at how they did this now as an adult, I'm like, man, this was genius. Uh, they didn't sit there and spend a year building up to this. You didn't need to. I mean, you had Hogan, who was running wild. Hulkamania was running worldwide. And then you had Andre the Giant. You didn't need to question his legitimacy. It didn't take much 
for you to understand that this was a badass dude, and he was a big motherfucker, and he could beat anybody on any given night. But I remember the emotions that is evoked out of me as a little kid, as I saw Andre slowly turn away from his friend Hulk Hogan. And then you get that great Piper's Pit segment where he rips off the shirt and the crucifix. And I'm sitting there crying. I'm like, why would you do that, Andre? Why would you do that to your friend? That weasel, he sucks. Don't listen to him. That's your friend. And that was exactly my reaction. And it was off to the races from there. When you talk about Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3 for the WWF Championship, I mean, you know all the backstories that you've been told over the years about Hogan being afraid to work with Andre and people not being sure if Andre was going to do the honors and do the job and all of this. But when you think about this, this was the match that allowed Vince to dream big enough to say, hey, I'm going to be in the Silver Dome and I think I could draw 93 plus thousand people and set a new indoor world attendance record. It was this match right here. And it was the two biggest stars at that time in the history of the professional wrestling business. When people sit there and talk about it, and sometimes I've mistakenly said this too, that Hogan was the first great international star of professional wrestling. That is 100% not true. Technically, the first great international star of professional wrestling that was known worldwide was Andre the Giant. And that is a documented fact. It's just that Hogan eventually took that mantle and took that place and became the biggest star in the history of the professional wrestling business. But when you talk about those moments in time and those matches where you see that symbolic passing of the torch, WrestleMania 3, here is it. Now, if you sit there and you watch this type of match featuring Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and expecting some great five-star masterpiece or see great work rate being demonstrated, then you are a moron. You know better. You should really know better. That's why I laugh when I remember, I think it was Meltzer gave it like minus three or minus four stars. You know, that's some dumb Mark bullshit right there because this match was about more than that. For all the people singing the praises of Steamboat and Savage talking about a five-star classic, if you ask most wrestling fans to this day from the past and the present what their mo moment, excuse me, they remember most about professional wrestling, more often than not, the runaway clear winner is going to be when Hulk Hogan body slammed Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3. Period. Period. And for Hogan to do that, he really took that last step to kind of become immortal. He beat that last major obstacle that he had. It was the ultimate thing, as Gorilla Monsoon said, of the irresistible force versus the immovable object. There's so many things going into this. The commentary, by the way, of Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura during this, even Jesse's little appearance promoting his uh, role in the Predator, is, they, were, they were outstanding. And, you know, when you're sitting there and you get to the main event and they're doing the tail of the tape and, you know, it was... There's just I could go on and on and on about this match, and I could go on and on about this pay-per-view. And again, like I mentioned, I do not mean to demean Steamboat and Savage, because it was a great Intercontinental Championship match. It was a great WrestleMania match. I do think over the years it has had its profile a little bit artificially inflated, but I can also say it does definitely have a place in the history of WrestleMania because it was that first kind of truly great WrestleMania match where you started to understand that maybe you could get some great wrestling on a sports entertainment card. But make no mistake about it, the match of the night, the match that all these years later everybody remembers, the match that brought 93 plus thousand people to the Pontiac Silverdome, the match that got millions of people to go to 160 closed circuit um, venues around the country at movie theaters, the, the match that got millions of people to buy it on pay-per-view at home was Hulk Hogan, versus Andre the Giant. This is a moment that's timeless. This is a match that's timeless. And this, to me, is a pay-per-view that is timeless. When you want to look at the representation of the WWF and the WWE in the 1980s, to me, WrestleMania three is the pinnacle. 
this is where it all came together and this show truly stands alone above itself in my opinion my favorite wrestlemania of all time and also in my opinion the greatest wrestlemania of all time is wrestlemania 3 100 percent beyond a question and a plus look at all the characters that were involved even the little celebrity involvement that you had was very well done here you look at steamboat and savage and then you look at hogan and andre and for an old school fan like me it just reminds me of how good the WWF used to be and what professional wrestling used to mean to me and hopefully someday will mean to me again.